As the story goes, Heart Mountain in Wyoming got its name from the Crow Indians, who thought it looked like the heart of a buffalo. Rising more than 8,000 feet, it's often shrouded in clouds. But far below, the dark clouds of history still linger. For it is here where the ghosts from one of America's most shameful chapters still roam. Whole time was one of tension, chaos, not knowing what was going to happen next. It was shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor that an executive order from President Roosevelt ordered anyone of Japanese descent living along the West Coast be relocated. As many as 120,000 people, most of them U.S. citizens, were rounded up, loaded onto trains, and sent to places like this, penned in behind barbed wire, their loyalty and their patriotism questioned. I remember in grammar school in San Jose, you know, we would all want to fight to be the one to carry the flag when we did the Pledge of Allegiance. So now here we are behind barbed wire, thought of as not citizens. Like so many others, Norm Mineta, born and raised in San Jose, California, to Japanese parents, was uprooted from his home, having no idea where his family was headed or for how long. Now, on that day that we left, I was wearing my Cub Scout uniform, baseball, baseball glove, baseball bat. And as I got on the train, the MPs confiscated my bat. They took your bat. And I went running to my father, crying about the MPs. Heart Mountain was one of 10 camps the government had hastily constructed. The Manettas arrived on a windy day in September 1942, moving their few belongings into their tar paper barrack. There was only one light in that 20 by 25 foot room held my mother, my dad, two sisters, my brother, and me. And out of all the people that were brought here, what percentage of them were citizens? Two thirds, close to 70%. At its peak, it held some 14,000 internees. That technically made it Wyoming's third largest city at the time, even bigger than the nearby town of Cody. The signs would go up, no Japs allowed, you sons of bitches killed my son at Iwo Jima. A young Alan Simpson lived just down the road. Were you worried about that as a kid? Well, you would because there was barbed wire all around the damn thing and guard towers with guys with guns and searchlights all aimed inside. So wouldn't you as a 12-year-old kid think there was something in there? I think you would. When the school bell rings, it's a signal for these students at Heart Mountain in Wyoming to change classes. The camp did operate like a small city. There were schools and farms and churches, even elections. But there was also boredom. To keep internees occupied, the agency in charge, the War Relocation Authority, allowed activities like ice skating, baseball, and much to Mineta's surprise, scouting. But his was a lonely troop. And our scout leaders would write to the scouts in all the towns surrounding, come on in for the jamboree. And they'd write back and say, no, no, those are prisoners of war and that we're not going in there. So they'd ride back and say, no, no, no. These are Boy Scouts of America. They wear the same uniform you do. They read the same manual you do. But none of them came in. Except that is for one, Alan Simpson's Boy Scout troop. His forward-thinking scoutmaster, Glenn Livingston, thought a visit to the camp embodied what the scouts stood for. And soon, Simpson found himself tying knots across from a Japanese-American boy who would become his lifelong friend. He always called me pesky, pesky little rascal. He was a spirited lad. <laughs> Which <laughs> meant what? In many, he was as ornery as I was. <laughs> and we couldn't figure ways to screw up anything we could get our hands on. They shared a tent, and that's where their troublemaking started, playing a prank on a fellow scout from Simpson's troop. There was kind of a bully in... It was raining to beat hell, and we kind of channeled the water down into this guy's tent. On purpose? Oh, yes. <laughs> we built a beautiful moat, and the tent came down. Norm said that I cackled as, as that happened. 
Did he cackle? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it was a lot of hee hee hees and a lot of ha ha ha's. As their time together unfolded, Mandetta remembers seeing a change coming over his new friend. He realized these are American citizens, and now they're behind barbed wire. They were American citizens. They were American boys. Even as a 12-year-old, he thought that was just totally unjust. Neither forgot their shared experience that day. They carried it with them through the decades that followed, through marriages and family, but all of it apart from one another. Did you guys keep in touch a little bit? We didn't ever see each other again until I read. You, Norman Wymanetta, solemnly swear that you... That he was the mayor of San Jose. Congratulations. So I wrote him a note. He wrote back saying, oh yeah, maybe someday we'll see each other or something, you know. Simpson noticed because he too had gotten into politics. And it's odd to me that people expect perfection in their laws when they don't have perfection in their lives. He grew up to become Wyoming's outspoken senator. The same smoke and mirrors have been pulled off by the Democrats and the Republicans. A seat he held for 18 years as a lifelong Republican. And it seems to me we ought to be going the other direction. Norm Mineta, who became a Democrat, went from that mayor's seat to congressman and then all the way to cabinet secretary. And I am proud to be chosen by you to be the first Asian Pacific American to serve in any president's cabinet. Under not one, but two U.S. presidents. So that is where the two former Boy Scouts reunited, under the Capitol Dome, some 35 years after they first met. And there we were, and we just went and started right over, just like that. And our friendship went back as if we were still sitting in that pup tent. Today, I hope that we will reaffirm the precious rights and the freedoms that are guaranteed by our great Constitution. In 1988, Simpson and Mineta joined forces to help pass the Civil Liberties Act, signed by President Ronald Reagan, which, for the very first time, formally apologized to Japanese Americans and granted reparations to those who had been imprisoned. Are you surprised that he's not bitter about what happened to him? That's the real one. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's a Mandela type of person. He never, bitterness never came over him. They didn't always agree on everything, but party, like that barbed wire, rarely came between them. And even when it did, they say it wasn't as pointed or as personal as the debates that dominate politics today. The word politics is interesting because it comes from the Greek, you know that. Poly meaning many and ticks meaning blood-sucking insects. <laughs> <laughs> we'd have fights in subcommittee, full committee, and yet we'd slap each other on the back, say, come on, let's go have dinner, let's go have a drink. And they don't do that. They just don't have that kind of personal relationship. Oh, <laughs> Both Manetta and Simpson are happily retired now, and every year return to Heart Mountain to help remind generations that came after theirs just how fragile freedom can be. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Every year, the crowd gets bigger, which says something about the growing interest in keeping what happened here from ever happening again. But in the midst of this somber memorial, this unlikely duo, Bring some much needed laughter, too. We don't talk with scouts and tying knots. We have organ recitals. How's your, how's your heart, liver? <laughs> <laughs> These are called organ recitals. <laughs> I really admire him, respect him, and love him. Just a wonderful, wonderful individual. We see each other and we just begin to, to laugh. There's no way to describe it. It's a love affair. I guess that's what you say. We just have fun together. Yes, there is a dark history here, but the human spirit is brighter. A friendship that reaches back decades has managed to shine the light of hope for generations.